Hello and welcome to Maximum Code for another tutorial on iterations, jump statements, indexers, and generics. In the past tutorials, we talked briefly about statements. In C Sharp, they perform some action, for example, declaring variables, assigning values, calling methods, and so on. There are also statement keywords, and they are executed in sequence. There are multiple categories of statement keywords, some of them you already used, selection statements, iteration statements, jump statements, and exception handling statements. Our focus is going to be selection, iteration, and jump statements. Let's review these items. Our next tutorial addresses the exception handling. So selection statements are if else and switch case. We have already seen how to use if else, but have not done a deep dive the anatomy of if else looks like this. If a condition is true, then execute the lines in the scope, but if false, then execute the scope of else. There is, however, one more condition in between, else if. When the if condition is not met and we have an else if, or many of them, they are evaluated. When true, the scope of else if is executed. When none of the else if conditions is met, the else is executed. Let's review this in an example. Our scenario is to create a method that produces a student grade based on the score of their exam. So if the student scored 90 plus, then they get an A. If they score 80 and less than 90, then it's a B and so on until we reach a failure grade. We'll work on creating this method using if else. The first if condition is going to be in two parts. The first part checks the grade number greater than or equal to 90. And the second part then or equal to 100. Both conditions must be true, which means we have to use an AND operator. We can also nest if statements to do that we can break up the two part if statement so that we evaluate the first condition, then the second. Let's keep the code as it was. The if condition can be one statement or many if statements do not have to follow with an else or else if. When running the scope of the evaluated if condition and we only have one line of code, we can omit the curly braces as they are optional. Microsoft recommends this approach, but you can choose for yourself on the coding style. The next statement is going to be else if and checks the grades between 80 and 89. We can follow this pattern until we have our else statement.
Now you are wondering, can you just use if statements and not else if? I mean, you could, but that would change the logic of the evaluation. The if, else if, and else are chained. Meaning that if we were to evaluate the if condition, then we would skip else if and else. If you just added if statements, then we would evaluate every if condition. So far, you have seen the following operators and, or, and not for the if and else. The double ampersand is an and operator where it evaluates to Boolean condition. For example, if we have two variables, X and Y, and both are true, evaluating them with the double ampersand will return true else if it's false. The double pipe is an or operator where it will evaluate two Boolean conditions. If we have the same variables as before, then it will evaluate to true. Please note that you have multiple conditions. The logical operation is checked until it's true from left to right. If we have a true, then we skip to the right conditions. Please note that you do not have the operators inside the selection statement. The exclamation is a negated operator where it will evaluate the Boolean value and will return the opposite, meaning that if we are evaluating a true condition and a negated operator is used, it will return false. Let's do one more example where we need to output the day of the week based on a numeric value. So if we got one, it would be Monday, two would be Tuesday, and three would be Wednesday, and so on. So then the if conditions would be if the variable day equals to one. Then it's Sunday, then evaluate the rest. If you look closely, there is a pattern here. We are evaluating a single value on all if conditions. This brings us to our other selection statement switch case. The anatomy of the switch statement is to match the switch value to our case if the case condition is met. Then we execute only that scope. So to rewrite this, it would look like this.
The difference between if and switch statements are if can have any number of variables that it needs to evaluate where switch only acts on characters or integer values. Switch statements are executed one after another until a break statement. So to be clear, if you have an if statement and it tests a string, a single string or integer across multiple conditions, it's the right candidate for a switch statement. Let's review one more example. In this example, we will use the date time to identify if it's a weekend or a weekday using switch statements. Notice that we can evaluate a constant pattern. We are basically saying that if it's Sunday or Saturday, then evaluate one scope. After evaluating the scope in the case statement, we then break out of the switch. This is a jump statement that we will discuss later. Just like the if statement, we also have a default, meaning that if no condition is met in the case, we will execute the default scope. Now, for the iteration pattern, we have already seen the statement where we loop through an array. The anatomy of the for statement is as follows. We state with for the keyword. Inside our open and close parentheses, we have an initializer and that is executed once before entering the loop. Here, we can set local variables that are only visible to our for statement and we can also call methods. If we have more than one initializer, then it's separated by a comma. The next section is the condition. If present, it must evaluate to a Boolean and the expression is executed for every iteration. So in our examples and usage, this was the condition that terminated our loops. The last part iterator section defines what happens after each iteration, meaning that after we leave our loop, we execute the iterator. And in our examples, we incremented the initialized variable so that the condition could evaluate if our loop was to end. Since we already gone over for statements, let's just create a for statement that goes forward and backward to show you how you can add more than one initializer condition and iterator.
Keep in mind that the for statement is to iterate through indexed values, but you are not limited to just that. Our current examples have been stepping by one. We can also step by two or more. Here we are going to increment the i value by 2. i plus equals 2 is equivalent to i equals i plus 2. If you do not use an initializer, condition our iterator section, then the loop will continue forever. Now let's go over the other loop types. The do iteration statement is another loop where we can enter the loop first, then the loop is evaluated, and if true, we can continue executing the body of do. A quick example is to iterate a number of times, then if the condition is met, we get out of the loop. The while loop is similar to do, but we check the condition of the loop before we enter the body. We also have a for each loop but let's skip that for now and come back to it once we learn more about iterators. When writing an application, you will always need to iterate through a collection of data. So far, we have used arrays. We are using the size of the array to iterate with a for loop. If you have an array and are iterating through it, you must select an indexer value in the range of the array. Otherwise, you will get an index out of range exception. There are times that you do not know the size of the collection you are iterating. For that, we enumerate through an enumerator. Let's create an int array of 10 numbers, zero through nine, then get an enumerator from it. This is another way of iterating through a collection without index values. We are going to use the while loop for this example. If we look at the get enumerator method, it returns an interface enumerator. Look at the interface. It has two methods, move next and reset with a property current. We can use the move next to loop and then use the current property to get the current value. So the move next will return a Boolean value that we can use for the evaluation of our while loop. Please note that we mentioned earlier you can use methods in the condition of the loops. Next, the body of the while, we can use the current to print out the values. The reset method moves the pointer of the enumerator back to the initial setting.
let's create our own enumerator. We are going to create a day of the week class that has Monday, Tuesday, and so on. Then use the while loop to enumerate. We are going to inherit from enumerator, then implement the contracts of move next and reset method and current property. So this was a simple example of creating our own enumerator instead of using arrays. Actually, we are using arrays, but its implementation is hidden from the code consuming our class. We need to point out something. Notice that the current property is returning an object. So if we did this with integer values and other value types, what happens is we, that we are now boxing the value if you were to convert it to their correct value type. When we work with other collections and generics, this can be avoided. Now let's do the same, but not use an ienumerator interface and instead use indexers. Indexers are built on top of the features of properties. So in short, you can access indexers by passing the index position of a collection and get back the data. We are going to use the same days of week class, but add an indexer to it. The indexer can have a getter and or a setter. Instead of a proper name, we can use the this keyword. The this keyword refers to the instance of the class. So in our case, the days of the week indexer. Indexer does not have to be int. You could, for example, use string, but you would need to implement retrieval of the object by searching until you found the string index. A quick detour. You generally want to use this keyword to qualify the member with the same name. For example, in the following class, we have a private name, same name, 
and the constructor of the class is passing a parameter with the same name. So to qualify the member of the class versus the parameter, we can add the this keyword to state that we mean to use the member of the class. So far we have seen arrays in a single dimension, but they can be multi-dimensional or jagged. So a quick example can be using our tic-tac-toe game board as multi-dimensional where we have one value, but three rows and three columns. Now let's work with this ray object directly. In the previous tutorials, we used the array object to resize our array. Arrays are suitable for fixed size collections. In the sample code, we will start with the array as our type and name of our variable. Then we set the array inside of newing it. This is because the array object has been restricted so that we can't use the new keyword. We will learn more about this on our object-oriented programming tutorials, but to create an instance, we use the method createInstance. 
It accepts a few parameters, we will use the simplest one. The first parameter is asking what type of object do we want to create than the size of it. We are now going to be introduced to a new keyword type of. Just as the name states, type of gets the instance of a type. In our example, let's pass an int and have an index of 10. To get or set values, you would use methods get value and set value. If we were to write the output of type of, notice we get a string representation of the type. So you are wondering if you don't know the size of the collection, is there an object for us to use? There are many objects in .NET for us to use. So let's start with ArrayList. ArrayList increases the size of the array dynamically as required. It's the same as what we did, but it hides the implementation. It also increases the size by one, whereas array resize would create a whole new array. So let's see how we can use ArrayList. We create an instance of the ArrayList and we just add to it. Notice that when we call add, the value passed is objects. If we were to pass ints, then they would be boxed. And when we retrieve it and convert it back, it would be unboxed. Now we are going to switch gears again and learn about generics. So if you didn't want to box and unbox, what should you do? We haven't go over why boxing is bad, only that it is good when you don't know the type of object you are dealing with. When we get to talk more about creating performant applications, boxing may be an issue and hinder performance. .NET has introduced generics to help what happens when you declare a generic is that you are deferring specification until the code is called by the caller. So let's use our array list and use generic instead. To do this, we will use the list class. We declare it with greater and less than characters and use string as the type. Now we can only add strings to the list. If we change the type to be int, we can then only add int values. What we got with generics is that we don't have to convert them and use them as a type we wanted. Does the list also dynamically increase as we add values? Yes. It's equivalent to the array list, except if a value type is used for the generic, then there is no boxing unboxing. Let's revisit our previous application and use the generic list. We will update both instructor and student. We need to fix this so that we don't have to recreate the array every time we need to add one value.
Now that we're using lists, we can come back to 4-H. As you noticed, we had to update the length property to count. We can still have the count and iterate through our list. For each allows us to iterate through our collection without an index value. So let's modify the for loop with for reach. The for reach has the collection that we are going to iterate and sets the current value in a, a variable. So when do you choose to use for versus reach? That depends, but let's see if we can help define a few differences. First, the most obvious or maybe not, the for reach can only iterate through collection where for does not as it uses a Boolean expression and even then you can omit that. That brings us to the next point, the for loops based on a Boolean expression where for reach will loop through the collection. When dealing with for reach, you cannot modify the collection that you are looping through, whereas for you can. A little more about foreach. So how does foreach work? If your type has a public get enumerator that is parameterless, then foreach will iterate through your type. Then use the current and move next. Must be parameterless and both must be public. So if you have a type and only a get enumerator method that returns an enumerator, then you would iterate using for each. You can also inherit from the I innumerable interfaces and for reach would be able to iterate through your type. We are not going to go deep into generics just yet, but just wanted you to know how it, to use lists. We will come back and complete the generic tutorial in our advanced C Sharp playlist.
So let's talk about jump statements. The following keywords are jump statements. Break, continue, go to, return, and yield. We will skip over the yield in this tutorial. We have used return where the return jump out of the method, no lines after the return is executed. We briefly saw break when used switch statements. When used, we break or jump out of the switch. You can also use break with loops. If a certain condition is met and you do not have to loop through until the end and break out of the loop early, break will only get out of the scope we are in. So for example, if we use two loop, one inside the other, then in the second inner loop, we have a break we only break out of that loop and not the outer loop. No code will execute in the scope after the break. What if you had a condition where you didn't want the rest of the scope in the loop to execute, but continue with the loop? You can then use the continue keyword. Go to can be used in a switch statement. If you had a scenario where you need to execute the code in a different case, you could use go to to jump to that case. Another scenario might be that you have nested loops and you had to break out of all. Then you could use go to. If you want to break out of a loop and use the go to, then you will have a label to tell the jump statement where to go. You can also use go to to jump in your code as in skip logic. It is extremely rare to see this.
In rare cases, an interviewer may ask you to write a loop in C Sharp without using one of the loops we have used. One way to do it, not that you should, is to use labels and go to statements. A question like this is a way to determine the breadth and depth of your knowledge about the C Sharp language and your thinking process. We stated this one way to do it, what's another way of doing it? You have already seen us use it before and where we called the method we were in, this is recursion, a method calling itself. Here is a real scenario that you may run into. You need to read a text document and count the words. To do this, we are going to learn a new data structure dictionary type. Dictionary are key pairs, meaning using a key, you can then store a value. So for example, in our word counter, we would keep track of the words with the counts in dictionary. Let's see how dictionaries work. Let's declare a dictionary and add some keys and values. Then use a for each to write out the key and value.
Now let's read the text file, then count the words, then write out the words in counts. We will read the text file as text, not lines. So now we have a string that holds our file with words. Let's remove all the periods, then split our string into words using space. Next, we loop through our words and check to see if we have it in our dictionary so that we can increment the count. If not, add it with a default value of one. Now we print out the results. Let's get creative and create a collection that has an index and a name. What we mean is that we need two indexers, one that can retrieve the value of a collection based on index position and another based on a string. In the real world, this scenario is getting data from the database. Then you can get the columns either by the index position or by column name. So let's create a simple object that inherits from a dictionary. Then allow it to add values and have two indexers where callers can ask for index position or key name to get the value.
So we are at the end of our tutorial. Thank you for joining us and we look forward to teaching you about delegates, events, exception handling, and reflection. As before, these tutorials are for beginner to intermediate, so we won't go too deep into the subject, but give you enough information for you to get started coding and having fun. We look forward to seeing you guys next time.